Bhakti Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. Okay, first I want to thank the Indonesian Buddhist community here in New York for inviting me to come for the dana today and for the uh, f- after the dana functions. Yeah, originally, they, you invited me to come in August, but it was just so hot in August that <laughs> I didn't want to travel to an inch out of Twangan Monastery. <laughs> so I suggested that we postpone till the weather turns cool. And today I think we have quite ideal weather for a visit. Yeah, so I want to speak a little bit about some of the reasons why we follow the Buddha's teaching. And though we treat the Buddha's teaching sort of conventionally, we say it's a religion, one of the great world religions, and certainly there are religious dimensions to Buddhism. But the Buddha does not appear in the world for the purpose, deliberate purpose of establishing a religion as a system of just belief and worship. But the Buddha's teaching is based upon the foundation of understanding what we call the law of causality, the principle of conditionality, that things depend upon conditions, arise from conditions. So this is the principle that gets developed in so many levels in the Buddha's teaching. Whenever the Buddha investigates anything, he always investigates in terms of the question, what is the cause of this? What is the condition? For what reason does this arise? For what reason does that arise? And so the Buddha investigates very deeply to understand the fundamental principles of things, the fundamental causes. Yeah, there's a verse in the Sutta Nipata that praises the Buddha as one. He, he calls him Mula Dasavi, which means the one who sees into the roots of things. So usually we just see things on the surface. Like we see, maybe we could see like many different trees. But the Buddha is one who looks below the surface to see what are the roots from which those trees arise. But the Buddha is not interested in looking into the causes and conditions of things just in a kind of objective, scientific way, but he directs this understanding of cause and effect to the human wish, the natural wish of human beings, and in fact, all living beings. The Buddha is also sata deva manusanang, whether human beings or the devas as well. The fundamental wish, the fundamental aspiration is to be free from suffering, and to find true, lasting, stable happiness. So those are the two fundamental urges of human beings, to be free from suffering and to find true happiness. But then the Buddha, you know, people are always, <laughs> the sort of the irony that the Buddha points out is that people are always seeking happiness trying to find happiness, but the great problem is that they're looking for, and they're trying to run away from suffering, to avoid suffering, to find happiness. And the great problem of human life is that though people are seeking happiness and trying to avoid suffering, but so much of the time, what we find, even when we're living in a fairly peaceful, stable environment, is suffering (laughs) and lack of happiness. So, you know, we have people who are like millionaires, billionaires. You think that would be the peak of happiness. You have all of the money you might want, and you could do anything you want with that money. But I think if you probably look into the sort of inner states of mind of some of these people who are like, say, a person has holdings of $5 billion, but he'll look aside and see, you know, the list, Forbes' list of the richest people. And if he's in eighth place with $5 billion, there are seven people ahead of him. (laughs) 
And so he'll be grumbling and complaining. <laughs> How is it that seven people are ahead of me in the quest <laughs> for, for maximum wealth? And maybe if you have <laughs> pop singers, you know, who's number one nowadays? Taylor Swift? Taylor Swift. <laughs> and who's number two? Beyonce. Beyonce. <laughs> Are, are they friendly? I don't know. <laughs> but there was somebody, I just saw like a headline, somebody was sort of looking, grumbling, at, always trying to find faults with Taylor Swift, <laughs> because maybe she was a pop singer, maybe in the eighth or ninth position. <laughs> so you get to be even, you know, one of the top pop singers, but if you're not in the number one position, there's some kind of discontent. And so you could imagine if people in the top positions have resentment, discontent, um, a sense of rivalry, competitiveness, worry. In fact, probably even people in the number one position, because there's always this competition. So you're the wealthiest person in the world, but you see the person in the number two slot is <laughs> buying up more companies, expanding his corporation, investing more skillfully than you are. And before long, when next year's Forbes report comes out, you're going to be knocked down to, from number one position down to two, three, four, or even you fall off the list entirely if you make some investing mistakes. If when you get to be the t number top singer, then you get to be in your late 30s, 40s. <laughs> and then there'll be upcomers, the ones who are in their 20s, starting to get more popular. And before long, people say, Taylor Swift, wasn't she uh, the, the, the big shot in the 2020s? <laughs> What's she doing these days? We're in the 2030s now. <laughs> And even we who are monks, you think like we're the most <laughs> famous, most popular monks, but then you get to be late 70s, 80s, and we have the younger monks in their 30s and 40s coming up. <laughs> 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 and the young Buddhists are thinking, ah, he's 75, 80 years old. <laughs> he doesn't understand our way of thinking. <laughs> Yeah, so and then we get those worries too. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so the, the the point is that people are always seeking happiness, but so often they're coming across suffering. Yeah, I remember years ago there was a book published by the Dalai Lama, and in the early pages he said that he often gets invited when he comp well now I think he doesn't travel but in those days he would often travel to the US and he would get invited to the homes of wealthy people and he says sometimes he has to go to the bathroom and when he goes out of curiosity he looks at the medicine cabinet <laughs> and he sees there's a tranquilizer <laughs> to keep you calm there's a what do they call this a a medicine that gives you more energy, <laughs> another medicine that gives you more energy, a medicine that helps you fall asleep at night. <laughs> so even these people that are sort of in wealthy positions, very high positions, also have these problems. And that shows that the problem of happiness and suffering, so it stems from the mind, not just from the outer conditions. And so this is what maybe what the one of the Buddha's great discoveries is that the real secret to happiness and suffering lies in the mind. And the Buddha, as one who looks into this principle of conditionality, investigating in terms of conditionality, finds the deep underlying roots of suffering. <clears throat> and he calls these the three unwholesome roots Probably you've come across these terms very often. In Pali, it's loba, dosa, moha, which we translate as greed, hatred, 
and ignorance or delusion. And so those are sort of deep forces that are deeply embedded in the human mind. And we all, as ordinary people, we all have to deal with those forces. But what we have to do is to prevent them from, first of all, spilling out and erupting in the form of unwholesome conduct. And so the Buddha lays down certain ethical trainings, principles, to restrain sort of the coarsest expression of these unwholesome roots. So we have, for example, the five precepts. So if you look at the five precepts to abstain from killing, so why do people kill? The basic reason is hatred. The, sort of the fundamental drive is hatred, but sometimes from greed. So because people, it's like you have bank robbery and somebody kills the guard in order to rob the bank. Maybe it doesn't work that way anymore with electronic banking. But um, greed for territory, to get more territory, so you have international conflict, one country goes against another country. It's not necessarily that they hate the other peop people in the other country, but they want to get more territory, and so they launch a war, and then they kill the other people. So we have killing, primarily from hatred, but sometimes from greed. Stealing, <coughs> stealing primarily from greed sexual misconduct, primarily from greed in the form of lust, false speech, telling lies, sometimes from greed, sometimes from hatred, and then the use of intoxicants. You think that you could just sort of escape from your misery, from your unhappiness, by dulling the mind. That's a kind of delusion. So we follow these principles, this ethical training, as a way of blocking off the coarsest expressions of greed, hatred, and delusion. But still, we have these mental states of greed, hatred, and delusion. They still arise in the mind. And so what we have to do is to work on training the mind in order to weaken them within our mind. So this is where we have the training in, we call this the training in samadhi or the adhichitta, developing a higher state of mind. You know, you could have a person, this is why it's not sufficient just to observe precepts, but we also have to train the mind. And as you know, Buddhists, especially monastics, we do it as a part of our regular monastic life. That is one of the purposes. But even lay people from time to time, though time might be short, there might be a lot of pressure from family, from job, and so on. But one should find time at least to devote short periods every day to sitting quietly, even for 10, 15 minutes, in order to try to train the mind. And often what we recommend is mindfulness of breathing but people have different tendencies, different inclinations. So what I suggest, especially people who have strong devotion, and maybe this is what the Buddha often taught to lay people, is the practice of six recollections. So this is recollecting the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, recollecting the one's virtues, one's moral practice, and recollecting one's generosity. And then the sixth is recollecting the devas, probably popular in ancient India, maybe not so meaningful today. But what I often recommend for people with devotional temperament is to use the recollection of the Buddha as their meditation subject. So we have the formula with the nine virtues or qualities of the Buddha, and you get to just don't just mechanically recite the Pali words, but get to know the meaning of those expressions. And you sit for about 15, 20 minutes and turn those qualities over in the mind using maybe a light visualization of an inspiring image of the Buddha. 
even visualizing the Buddha sitting in the heart and then generating that devotion from the heart. And that helps to generate a kind of purifying energy that can rise up from the heart and gives a kind of inner joy. And that's the important quality to develop in meditation is happiness or joy in the practice. And of course, at the beginning, it's difficult, no matter what meditation subject you choose, mindfulness of breathing, sensations in the body, recollection of the Buddha. Of course, it's the natural tendency of the mind to wander. Like our minds have been wandering from thought to thought, plan, one plan after another, image after image, memories of the past, plans for the future, regrets about the past, hopes for the future. That's the natural way that the mind works. And what we're doing with the practice of meditation is tying the mind down to something simple that helps us to make the mind calm and to come to see into the workings of our mind. The suttas compare it to taming a wild cow, or a bull, actually the cow maybe is quite docile, but it's the bull that's wild. <laughs> so, so if you want to tame the bull, what the farmer or the bull trainer will do, actually it's the example given in the suttas is taming the elephant, the wild, because the king wants to use the elephant. So they capture the elephant from the forest and they bring it to the royal capital. And what the elephant trainer has to do is to tie the elephant to a post, a strong post. And once the elephant is tied to the post, it doesn't just settle down and say to the king, teach me what you want me to do and I'm willing to do it. But the elephant will fight and pull and struggle to get free. The elephant wants to go roaming in the forest. And so it's like with our mind, the mind just wants to go roaming through the forest, the forest of indulging the desires, the fantasies, the plans, projects, going out with friends, watching the television, going on the internet, doing all sorts of, finding all sorts of enjoyments, roaming here and there. So what we do with the meditation object is like binding the elephant to the post, even just for, as I, as I said, 15 or 20 minutes, just tying the mind down. And the mind is going to pull and struggle. But we just keep on going back to the object over and over. And what happens with the elephant after it pulls and struggles for so many days? It gives up, settles down, quiets down, and then the elephant trainer can start to train the elephant to perform its work. And so with our mind, we tie the mind to some kind of meditation object. And over time, it's not days like the elephant, not even weeks, but it's a matter of practicing months and years, gradual training. The mind starts to become more peaceful, more calm, more happy, and more under our control. So we're not just driven around by the mind, but we have mastery over the mind. Well, maybe not mastery, but we have some degree of control over the mind. Okay, so with the training in meditation, it's a way of calming the mind and developing this inner happiness that leads us away from the attraction of the worldly happiness. The worldly happiness seems to be pleasurable, but it, usually it ends in disappointment, frustration, and sometimes even more serious forms of suffering. But that kind of happiness that you get from training the mind in meditation, that is a happiness that can't be taken away.
Of course, it doesn't depend on external things, but it's something you have in your heart. Okay, but even beyond the calming the mind in meditation, we have to deal with these roots of greed, hatred, and delusion. And this requires the training in wisdom. And the training in wisdom takes place at different levels. So there's the higher training in wisdom is the practice of insight meditation. But at the outset, we don't have to be concerned with that but to understand what I would call the fundamental principles of the Buddha's teaching and to see how we could apply them to our own life, to use these principles as tools of understanding to help us deal with the struggles we face, the decisions we face, the situations we face in our everyday life. So what is like some of these fundamental principles of the Buddha's teaching? So I could take just, you know, there are many principles, but probably the most best known principles are the three characteristics of impermanence, dukkha or unsatisfactoriness, and anatta, non-self. So at the highest level, these are to be realized directly and clearly through the practice of insight meditation. But in our everyday life, we could use them as themes for reflection, for the principles that we reflect upon and then apply to the situations we face in our everyday life. So for example, we have Taylor Swift now has learned some Buddhism. She's number one most popular singer. And (laughs) time goes on. And the younger singer is just climbing the chart, climbing the chart, and now she's knocked down. (laughs) Number three, number four. She knows Buddhism now, so she can reflect. Wow, this is an example of impermanence. (laughs) (laughs) Everything changes. Sometime in the bloom of my youth or early 30s, I'm number one, but as time goes on, things have to change, and it's inevitable that I'm going to be dropping down on the population list, and other singers will be coming up number one. (laughs) The (laughs) billionaire who sees others getting, you know, wealthier than he is, learns that applying the principle of impermanence, like this is the way it is, that you know, sometimes I'm the wealthiest person, other times I drop down. But we don't have to think of people in those top positions, but in our own everyday life. And so you could take a case like, say, some of our loved ones, parents, husband, wife, brother, sister, cousins pass away. And so if you don't have understanding of Buddhism, you think, why does this happen to me? I'm just so miserable. Oh, I'm a real loser in life. Other people are happy, but oh, my loved one is gone. I'll just never get over this. So if you don't have understanding of impermanence, you just fall into this state of deep grief, deep misery. Okay, what I say when we lose loved ones, sometimes there's an ideal in Buddhism that you should accept the loss of loved ones with perfect equanimity. But I don't quite agree with that. What I say is that it's natural to feel grief, to feel sorrow. You've lost a loved one, can't be replaced. But you apply the understanding of impermanence. And you know that it's inevitable that there had to be some parting and separation. Either I go first and they remain behind, or they go and I remain behind. So you use this principle of impermanence, and you also know the law of impermanence that now I'm feeling deep grief, but as time goes on, that grief will subside. I could continue to remember the loved one with appreciation, with cherished memories, I'm not overwhelmed and defeated by that loss. 
So in this way, we could use this understanding of impermanence to help us with our grief over the loss of loved ones. If you lose a job, you're in a position, they get, you get, they call the pink slip, when they give you, okay, you're dismissed. I'm sorry, we have to downsize, and you're gone. So you, of course, you feel disappointment, but if you have the understanding of the law of impermanence, you don't fall into this deep pit of misery. Okay, so we could say that here we have cases of understanding impermanence and dukkha, the unsatisfactory nature of life. And we could also use the principle of anatta, non-self. So sometimes we get praised, sometimes blamed. When we have this deep clinging to self in the mind, when we're praised, we think, oh, I'm the greatest, I'm number one. Wow. When we get blamed or criticized, oh, why does this have to happen to me? Everybody's against me. I don't know how to overcome this. And so we're, what lies behind this praise and blame, you're lifted up by one, pushed down by another, fame in obscurity, everybody knows your name, so you're happy, elated. Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's he? <laughs> Nobody knows who you are, you get miserable, praise and blame, fame and obscurity, gain and loss, pleasure and pain. So you get shifted around, shaken by these, they call these the eight worldly dhammas, eight worldly winds. But if you have the understanding of anatta, non-self, when you're praised, nobody here. <laughs> Just five skandhas, five khandhas. Blamed, nobody here. <laughs> Just five khandhas, right? <laughs> Fame, what's famous? Just five aggregates. Bodily form, feelings, perception, mental formations, consciousness. Obscurity, just five obscure <laughs> aggregates. So in this way, you, we use these understanding of these three characteristics to deal with these situations we face in everyday life. And then based on that understanding from everyday life, we can investigate even in our meditation, start examining the nature of our body and our mind and seeing that the body is always changing, bodily form always changing, the mind is always changing. And in that way we start to see impermanence at the deep, subtle level of our own body and mind. And so it's that kind of deep insight into the three characteristics that eventually cut off those roots of greed, hatred, and delusion. Okay, so maybe this will do as a little talk. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you so much, Bande.